Hi, my name's Christine Mayer. I'm 67 years old. Today is October 7th, 2015. We're here in Sacramento, California. And I'm here with my former student, Hip Patrick Ma. Um, and our relationship has been more like son and daughter recently. You mean son and mother? What did I say? Son and daughter. <laughs> oh, I do mean, I do mean son, mother and son. Mother and son, yes. Hello, my name is Patrick Ma. Um, a lot of people know me by my um, legal name, which is Hip Ma. I am 25 years old. Today is October 7, 2015. We are here in Sacramento, California. And Chris Mayer is my mother. And I always, I have always seen her as my mother, um, even though she's my former teacher. Hmm. So, hi, Mommy. How are you? I'm good. Good. So, I was thinking back to when we met, and I don't remember the exact day. Did hmm. Were you there at the beginning of the school year at Cordova High School? I don't think so. Um, could have been. It's, it's fuzzy. Fuzzy for you, too. Yeah. So, I came, um, I migrated from... Uh, Vietnam to the United States in 2007 and I was in Pennsylvania for two months with my biological mother before I moved here to California. Um, I think I got here during the summer. So, okay, so yeah, you probably so I, started, I started the school year. Yeah. I just remember that I had two other Vietnamese boys and I sat you, yeah. you kind of sat towards the back of the room but on the teacher's side where the desk was yes. on the side. Yeah. And I was so happy to have some Vietnamese students because my first experience with teaching ESL with, was with Vietnamese students after mm -hmm. the war, the Vietnamese, uh, the Vietnam War was over. Mm -hmm. And immediately I had Vietnamese students. Mm -hmm. So they had four periods of English with me, remedial mm -hmm. reading, yeah. and art and PE. Yeah. It was good that you sat me with them because we actually become friends later on mm -hmm. for the two years, remaining two years of my high school there. Um, they were cool. One of them is actually now um, in pharmacy school. Wong is in pharmacy Great. school. Is that D? Yeah. D, I have no idea what mm -hmm. he's doing with his mm -hmm. life. And yeah. that's another topic. <laughs> yeah, it is. But I, I, and you, I sit people with in language groups because then you can help each other translate. Right. And um, I remember that every, even you weren't like flapping your hand around to volunteer to mm -hmm. speak English, yeah. but you were the first one to kind of emerge as the speaker from that group. From the group, yeah. And we moved from the back to the front really quickly because yeah. I, I just, I'm a bit of a teacher's pet. So, right. you know, I like to sit in the front and I like to, you know, command the attention, which. It's, Sometimes a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think that you wanted to be clear, yeah. and you were you were really wanting from the beginning to work on your pronunciation. Yeah. I and did. it was easy for me if I was right there by you to catch a word you were saying wrong and mm -hmm. have you repeat it and let you see my tongue and my yeah. mouth. And yeah. How to say it the right way. Yeah, that was so. interesting. So it was we. I came here in two thousand seven. So we. Um, know each other for eight years. After yeah. I graduated from high school, I went on to community college and then Davis. And right. recently you just... Um, I you went had, to your graduation. You did. And how was the experience? Well, I was so excited to be invited. And <laughs> Daddy and John mm -hmm. went with me. And I was just... I knew you were going to get an award, but I had no idea it would be such a big deal because there were hundreds of your college graduating, and there you were up on the stage mm -hmm. with, like, three students and all the bigwigs, the chancellor and the head of departments, yeah. and um, and they gave three awards that day, mm -hmm. and you received two of them. Yeah. And I can't remember what they're for. Yeah. Besides your fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was nerve-wracking. I would never thought that graduation would be a big deal because mm -hmm. um, we graduate. I graduate from community college, and you went to my little ceremony. Right, and your award ceremony. Yeah, award ceremony. And I thought, you know, well, 
David's graduation is just another graduation. You know, like mm-hmm. I work hard all year long, and they that just you stand up, you stood up, and you get your degree, uh, your little diploma, mm-hmm. and you sit down. There was nothing special about it, but this year was special. Yeah. It's after I I I looked back at it, and I thought it was magical. I was because, crying. Yeah. Well, um, first of all, it was. You know, it was an honor because um, during the last quarter of my senior year, I applied for two awards. I applied for five. I got two. <laughs> I got four, but um, two of them is they have their own award ceremony, and it was on, on were not on the stage um, of the right. day of the graduation. Right, it was before, and I got to go to that. Oh, you got to go to that. I remember. That's mm-hmm. right. Oh, they so, had good food afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> so we, I applied for five awards. Um, I got two awards for community service. Mm-hmm. Um, one was particularly for the mental health service um, uh, work that I do in Sacramento. Um, and then another one was for the work that I do with CARES, which is which was a HIV clinic in Sacramento. And now they are a community clinic, so they expand. Mm-hmm. But I worked there for four years, and um, my work was recognized. And they also gave me those awards. Um, the two that was on the stage, one was the Valois Plan Junior Award, and that was also for um, community volunteer, s- yeah. volunteer and community mm-hmm, service. Mm-hmm. But it's more prestigious because you get actually get recognized on the stage, and they give you a plaque, and you know they give you <laughs> a money. A picture with they the give, chancellor. Yeah, and they give you money. Money's um, nice. Money was nice. Money was nice. Um, it helped for the. The grad school that I just applied to, which we will get to later. Right. Um, the other award was, if I remember correctly, was um, oh, um, it was the um, for the most outstanding senior of the mm-hmm. class, two thousand fifteen. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't remember the name of it now. Well, I it think was it so had recent. it was based on grade level and volunteerism. Right, and, right. Yeah, yeah, and I mean the description was amazing. Well, I definitely had tears in my eyes Aww. because you knew that I'd gone to UC Davis. Yeah, we bought Aggies. Go Aggies! Yay! Um, I thought it was it just the whole thing was magical because. Um, we got to go to breakfast the morning before. Yeah. And you guys got special seating because mm-hmm. like, I'm receiving awards. And I remember getting into it, like we were, were a little bit late because we tried to get everybody together. Right, and it didn't happen. It didn't happen because <laughs> my cousin was late. I'm like, darn it, Billy. <laughs> um, but everybody got there. We got to eat breakfast. You guys went to your seat. I got to... Um, take a picture with the chancellor and... Uh, um, you put it on Facebook yeah, right the away. the principal, you know, and, yeah. and the chancellor, and everybody was there, you know, and there's three students. Um, what was the most wonderful moment of the entire thing was when we walked out, I thought, personally, when we walked out. So we were backstage, uh-huh. um, and then all these students I saw... Were because, standing. Right, and we... I saw all these students walk down and line up, mm-hmm. you know, both sides of the, of of the, the, the walkway. Yeah. yeah. And um, here we were, you know. The, Walking down the middle. Yeah. The chancellor led the way, and yeah. there was everybody else, and there was me, and I was in the middle. Well, I all was th- way up in the balcony. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, all of my colleagues were looking at I felt at like you. looking at me when I walked down the middle of the aisle. It was yeah. the most magical moment of my entire career at UC Davis. Um, and what was more special was when we sat on stage, you know, like I felt, um, I always tried to remain humble, but I felt proud because my family was there, mm-hmm. you were there, my cousin were there, mm-hmm. and I felt like I was giving you guys the recognition that you Deserve. Right, because, because they did recognize, fa- yeah. you know, the family, the family yeah. for all the work that you that know. We'd I done. can't. I could not have done it alone without you guys. Well, and once you got to Davis, I didn't have to correct as many English papers as because many I have papers. A <laughs> well, he helped too. Yes, but it was like I think by then your vocabulary was. Phenomenal. Thank you. You know, you'd picked up so much. Because yeah. I was, I, I, what do you, th- what about you 
let you go from, you know, how many years did it take it take you working and going to school when you went to community college? Four years. Four years. Yeah, yeah. But you were working the whole time. Yeah. And when you were at Davis, were you working at Davis or did I was not. I was not working. How many um, scholarships had you applied for? Over my entire college career? Well, I'm kind of thinking it must be almost 100. Uh, s- somewhere around there. Yeah. 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 We didn't get 100. but We didn't get them all. Yeah, we didn't get them all. But I applied for a lot. I know. You yeah. did. You went out there and found the money that was available for yeah. you because yeah. of your 4.0. <laughs> I I used to tease you. What yeah. did I tease you about? Oh, the bee party. A bee, oh, the bee party. Yeah, I, got I said to be part of our family, you really have to get one bee, and right. then we're going to have a gigantic bee party. I know. We never did get to have that. I was terrified. Oh, God. <laughs> every time. It's like, if you remember, even in community college, every beginning of every semester, I called you frantically. and You were you were worried. You were scared about what was Somehow I would come. get a B, God forbid. You yeah. Know? And, you know, there's times where we came close, but we never did. No. So. No. Um, but, yeah, the, the, the award, um, back to the graduation, it was great because, you know, I sat on the stage and they announced the speaker – you know, they announced the, um, the speaker. He was not the valedictorian. Right. He was just a speaker. For, Motivational speaker for, for the t- class. For the class. Yeah. And he announced, they announced him. He stood up and he spoke. And then they announced um, another girl in my class, Kathy. Mm-hmm. And um, she got an award and she sat down. They announced my name for the same award, which I stood up and, and um, received. And then I sat down. And then they... Announced my name again. <laughs> and I just, you know, like I think Billy stood up and he was so, he was so proud and he was so happy um, about the event. And it was, it was great because I got to stand up, I got to stand up twice. It was fantastic. And it yeah. was, I was so, it, it seemed like all the work that I have done is worth it. Yes. You know, because sometimes when you do a lot of work and you don't see the result immediately, it can mm-hmm. be quite discouraging. And yeah. You know, it was worth it. It was worth it. Well, you've come a long way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the total I went to, a lot of people go to school for four four or five years to get Mm -hmm. the bachelor's degree. I went to school for six years. So I came here in 2007. I went to high school with you for two years. Were you, the second year, though, I think you were in regular English. You took 12th grade English, didn't you? I did. And... I had you as my TA, so you would have an hour for homework. Right. And you also helped me because we got two Vietnamese girls in who didn't speak yeah. any English. Mm-hmm. And that was one thing I always liked was that you always had time for other people, to help other people. I try. And during that, th- that was the year where you had a—what made that year so difficult for you? Well, in terms of your home life, yeah. Um, well, you know, it's it's it was a long process that led to that year. So mm-hmm. you know, we would have to go back in time to. Well, go back, to, go back to, to Vietnam. What was it like for you as a child in Vietnam? It was difficult, you know, and most of the time was, um, you know, it, we were just poor, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so my mom and my dad um, divorced right after I was born. I was born and raised in Vietnam. So my mom and my father, um, I call him father, my mom and my dad divorced right after I was born. I was one month old when my mom left. And came to the United States. And came to the United States by herself. She fleed, literally, mm-hmm. because my dad happened to be an alcoholic and abusive father. And husband. And, and husband. Right. And my mom just could not take it anymore, you know, and she flee without me. And I think the moment that she left is when my father geared to- all of his hatred towards me, mm-hmm. you know. Um, I resemble my mom a lot, oh. which is a good thing because I have been told. Because she's that very pretty. She was pretty. Yeah. Uh, she, she is, is pretty. She is pretty. Um, but by the same token... Because I look so much like my mom and resemble her, my father beat me 
from the day that I was six months old until the day that I was 13. Who helped keep you alive during that time? Um, from zero to 13, my grandma, I would say. Because she came with wonderful manners. She'd be very proud of you. I think she would appreciate that. Well. But, um, yeah, she would tell me um, that my father, my grandma, told me that he beat me since I turned six months old, and she would have to carry me and run off to neighbor's house. And hide. And hide, because he would come home really drunk and pull me out of bed and stop beating me. I mean, I couldn't even imagine how a how do you beat, how would you beat a six months old? You're so lucky to have all your brain power. Yeah, and I doubt it sometimes, because... No, I, I, I mean, I... I you had told me about the beatings, right. but until you were at our house and it was Ellie had a birthday party or something and you were swimming, I'd never seen the scars on your back. Yeah, and I just burst out crying. Yeah, I mean, you telling me, mm -hmm. and then me seeing the results of that right. was, I mean, I've got goosebumps right now. Mm -hmm. It was awful. It was. It was. I mean. My my grandma told me that as a six months old baby, he would slap me, he would pinch me. Um, I was lucky I didn't have, um, I didn't die because you know. Oh yeah. <laughs> with the, they don't call it shaking baby syndrome anymore. But he shake he shook me mm -hmm. a lot as a child. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I, I, I have problem with memory. You know, like oh. my memory can could be quite fuzzy because. I don't know what happened to me as a child. I never got the proper health care that we could have mm -hmm. because I live in Vietnam and it's a third. It Very was poor then. It was a third world country. It is still a third world country, and mm -hmm. the health care system is not like here. And I remember, um, you we know, just just like yesterday. Um, I mean, my dad beat me every single day, and that was a fact. But something that I would probably carry until the day I die and take it to my grave is the birthday of my 13 it's my 13th birthday you know it's the day of my birthday and I went to bed there was no celebration because of course my drunken dad would not give me anything for my birthday um, I was in bed get ready to sleep because I have school the next day you know I think it was a Thursday night um, my dad came home drunker than I have ever imagined, like, remember him. And he stopped pulling me out of bed and stopped beating me. You know, what's sad was, at the age of 13, I was so used to his physical abuse that I just stopped crying. Right. Because I knew... It didn't matter. It didn't matter how hard I cry or how, how much I beg. He would not stop until he's done. I knew that. So I just sat in a fetal position and let him do his thing. But, but it got what, worse. That, it got worse. Yeah. I, what I didn't anticipate that day was that after beating me, he stripped me naked and made me stand in front of our house. I was 13. Just coming into puberty. I just went into puberty. And you... you you remember at 13 how embarrassed you were about your body. Everything. <laughs> yeah, let alone being naked in front of the house with wound and blood dripping from my wound. And I remember asking you, weren't, you know, didn't, I mean, people saw you. Right. And they didn't reach out to help you. Right. They did, you know, like if anybody was trying to help me, my dad would yell at them and pull, pull me back in the house and continue to beat me until I pass out. I mean, that day I did not feel um, humiliated. Humiliation wasn't a word that came in my mind. Mm -hmm. I felt violated mm -hmm. as a human being, you know, like it shook me to the core. Yeah. And the next day when I woke up, I had all these questions in my head. Why was this, Why am I still here? What's my purpose in life? What at am I? At thirteen, yeah, you I had those questions. At thirteen, and at the age of thirteen, those questions I cannot come up with the answer to those questions. Mm -hmm. So I decided that I could not take it any longer. So I decided to take my own life, and I I attempted.
I went to my friend's place and um, locked the bathroom door and slit my wrist. Who found you? My mom's friend um, went up to the bathroom to find her earrings, and she knocked on the door, and nobody was answered. It was locked. She called her husband. He came up, banged on the door. I was unconscious in the pool of my own blood, and they, um, the husband just knocked the door open and saw me and rushed me to the hospital. Mm -hmm. They was very generous. My friend was rich. The family oh, was rich. So, so they was very generous. They pay for the entire hospital bill. The hospital, the the healthcare system in Vietnam is nothing like the U.S., where you came in and the hospital cannot dump you. There's right. a there's a law. Nineteen, I think, uh, 1982. There's a law that was passed. It's called no patient um, dumping. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the hospital has to treat you Here. by law mm -hmm. in the U.S., regardless of your coverage status. Right. In Vietnam. If you go to the hospital and you don't have cash mm -hmm. and you die, nobody care. They just put you outside. They just toss your body outside. They don't care. Yeah. It's inhumane, but that's just how the system works. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, fa the my friend's family was so generous that they pay, I don't know how much money it convert to the U.S. dollar. Right. But it was so much money that I couldn't even count on, you know. How long were you in the hospital? I was... In there for about two days, mm -hmm. and um, they agreed to pay for everything with one condition, that I would never tell a soul about the incident. Well, so much for that, because <laughs> I'm we here and we sharing the story, and right. I, and I'm a motivational speaker, so I have shared my story, you know, many many right. times, and I have videos. Did you go home with them? I did for for a little bit, and then I came home. I came back home to your dad to my dad. Well, because I didn't have anywhere else, else to, to go. go. Was yeah. your grandmother dead by then? No, she wasn't dead by then, but I didn't think about going to her because all of my stuff is at my dad. Oh, and yeah. And you probably I, wanted to go back to school knowing you. Yeah. So I came home that day. Of course, I didn't notice I was drunk. Nobody noticed I was gone because it's just me and my dad. And when he's drunk, he doesn't know anything. Um, so I came home and he was already drunk and as soon as he saw me, he started taking his belt off. <sighs> and I knew what he was going to do. And, you know, like after the near-death experience, in my mind, I was just like, you know what? Screw you. And I got the baseball bat next to me, and I banged him in the head really, really, really hard. But as a 13 years old, I didn't have that much upper body strength, per Well, se. and you just got out of the hospital. Right. But it was easy for him to pass out because he was already drunk, <laughs> you know. And I, I took everything that I could carry as a little boy, and I went to my grandma's place. Mm -hmm. And I was crying and tell her that I told her that I do not want to go back there. I do not want to live with him. If you don't let me stay here, I'm going to kill myself, you know. And she let me in, and we never looked back, yeah. you know. My dad came looking for me, I think, but... She didn't let you yeah, out. Yeah, my grandma would just didn't have it. She well, didn't it was it. her son, right? It was her son, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, I, I lived with her for about two years, and um, she passed away from a traffic accident, you know. She was just passing, pass, uh, just crossing the street, and a motorcycle didn't See her. watch out for her, and, you know, he hit her, and she was in the hospital for two weeks, and she passed away. What did you do during this time? I was in school, of course, um, and I came visit came to visit her as much as I can. Mm -hmm. um, her face was so swollen. Yeah. And I cried when I saw her of because course. you know it's distorted her face, and mm -hmm. I I didn't recognize my grandma, someone who I loved very much. About. How old were you when that happened? I was fifteen. Yeah. Two years. Yeah. So you were with her the last two years. Yeah, yeah. And then did your mom know any of this was going on? Um, At the time of my grandma's death, my mom just started to contact me. Um, she actually came to the U.S. and didn't even, I don't, I don't think she thought about me. 
at all. Well, just from you just were from a the month pro- old. Just from the story that I'm collecting um, from my relatives and my grandma. But my aunt told me I have two aunts. One live here in Sacramento, in South Sacramento. And one live in Orange County, California. And the one that live in Orange County saw my mom when she was just out and about, you know, and you know, remember her, grab her, and told her that you have a son and he's alive, you know, and you need to contact him. And that's how my mom first initiating the contact with me in Vietnam. And she was sending money, a little bit of money. She sent like $100. To, in Vietnam, $100 it a goes, lot. Yeah. It goes a long way mm-hmm. for a little boy at least. Um, but at the time of my grandma's death, she was contacting me and getting the paperwork ready for me to, you know, come. Um, to come to the United States. Uh-huh. And um, as soon as I, my grandma passed away, um, she started the process. Did it, it take a long time? It took two years for the paperwork to go through. So when you finally came, you were 17? I was 17. Yeah. And but you... um, the time that the two years after my grandma died, I think it's just as horrendous as the years that I lived with my dad because here I was without any sponsor whatsoever, Mm -hmm. well, emotionally at least. My aunt was sending money to help out. Um, My mom was sending money to help out. But I did not have a parent figure. Mm-hmm. I know I no longer had a parent figure when so my grandma passed away, mm-hmm. and we have my grandma had eleven kids. Some of them die, some of them pass away, um, but there was five family living in a five bedroom house, and which you, is you which were was a there. big house. Yeah, and I was there, but I didn't have a room. You you know yeah. what I mean? I, I know I was, you, you weren't a family. You were a single. Individual who float around between room to room, mm-hmm. um, and you know, even though I had money from my 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 um, grandma and and I mean my 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 mom and my aunt, I never had enough food to eat or clothes to wear. Mm-hmm. You know, growing up, but up until that point, it was just getting it, it got worse. Yeah, um, I think it was after my grandma passed away. Um, I remember the incident. It was so taunting to me. Um, I came home that day, and there was no, not there was nothing in in the fridge with my name on it. Usually, there's food with my name on it, so mm-hmm. I know how much I could eat, mm-hmm. and you know, like how much I have to save for dinner or whatever. And um, I came home, and there was nothing in the fridge. I was starving. I didn't have breakfast that morning, mm-hmm. so I came home from a long day at school and there was nothing in the fridge for lunch and I remember going to the went to the um, the sink to wash my face and I saw dishes stack up you know and one of them has leftover in them leftover food on the dish which was ran over they pour water over it already there was no soap just water but it was like soggy and Mm -hmm. there was soggy leftover on the dish I remember I was so starving that I start picked up the leftover and ate it. Of course, it was food. Yeah, but um, I remember. I remember. Humiliating. I was crying as I ate it yeah. because it was beyond my threshold, you know, of shame. But nobody saw me, so you know, I I wiped my tears and I walked away like nothing happened. Um, but it took two years for my mom to, um. Bring me to the U.S. Mm-hmm. and um, I came here at the age of seventeen. How long did you last in Pennsylvania? Oh yeah, we came to Pennsylvania, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, to be mm-hmm. exact. It was man, what a shock! Bucolic little town it was. Uh-huh. You know, it was so rural and pastoral. You know, right? It, it just its inhabitants are interesting. Um, but yeah, I, I was there for two months. I mean, my mom was difficult. I mean, my my first memory of my mom was, I think I was 13, 13, 14. Um, she came. Oh, she came to Vietnam? Before she started the process. Oh. I remember this 
very pretty lady, short. You know, she has a smile on her face. Didn't seem genuine at that point.、Mm-hmm. But all I could remember was the happiness in my heart.、That、you know, I was exulting with joy、uh-huh. for the first time in my life. Someone is going to take care of me. Wants me. Not because they have to, but because they want to. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah.、Um, but、uh, it's a different experience at seventeen. Oh, to. Live with your mom. To live with my mom. Well, and there were other complications. Oh yeah, but I remember the first day was what happened. The first day was I saw snow, <laughs> and you know, living in a tropical country, snow is foreign to me. Right. So I saw snow, and the first thing I do is open the door and experience snow. I I think I experienced snow for about five seconds before the alarm went off. You know, and I I didn't know. I mean, in、oh, Vietnam, we never. Oh, the home alarm. Yeah, we never have burglar alarm. You right. Know, so I didn't know it was on. My mom never told me anything <laughs> about it. So you know, I saw snow, and I had to walk out and and try it. You right. Know, and touch it. Touch it. And, and smell feel it. it.、Um, my mom and my stepfather. My my mom remarried at that time. So、mm-hmm. my mom and my stepfather stepped down the stair and was screaming at the top of their lungs. Like, Are you nuts? And I'm like, I had no idea what was going on. Like, you know, they turned off the alarm, and I got scolded for open the door for opening the door, which I had no idea would cause a, a scene、mm-hmm. at six o'clock in the morning. I had jet lag, so and here、sleep. you're trying to、yeah. make a good impression, <laughs> right?、Um, so that was so much for my impression. Like, it was ruined. Right. You know, I'm a perfectionist, so that didn't sit well. But、um, two months living with my mom, she found out about my sexuality. I'm happen to be a gay man, and I like boys. And she did not know that, nor could she accept it.、Um, You'd hidden it from everyone, hadn't well, you?、Did. Except a few friends in Vietnam. I had a couple gay friends in Vietnam where, you know, we have a sense that we are gay. But we never talked about it.、Mm-hmm. We would talk about boys, like, "Oh, he's cute,"、mm-hmm. and you know, he's handsome. But we never, out loud, say that we are gay men、right. because we didn't. The the society at that point was not accepting. It、yeah. is more accepting now in Vietnam,、mm-hmm. but it's still not to the same level as it is in the U.S. in California. Right.、Um, but yeah, I hid it from everyone because I didn't want to disappoint anyone. Mm-hmm. You know, being gay is like committing a crime. Well, you had told me that basically it like damns your ancestors back through time. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it was like this worst thing that could happen to a family to a boy. Oh, a girl. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. But, But you were a boy. You would bring shame to the family. You、yeah. will bring shame to the family. So. I know you came out. One of your aunts, the 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 aunt that's in South Sacramento, was in was in Rancho Cordova, and、um, she took you in. Yes. So. How did your mom find out that you were hiding? Good question. So,、um, what happened was I was chatting with this guy in Vietnam,、um, platonically, of course, but you know, like the way that we use the term was affectionate. You know,、mm-hmm. as a boyfriends would, as、mm-hmm. boyfriends would to each other, and、um, I think I was visiting my cousin at that point in California, and my cousin found out because it was his computer, and、oh. I was using his computer. So when I lock off, he lock on by mistake, saw all that, told my aunt, my aunt told my mom, and when I flew back to Philadelphia to my mom, I was, I mean Pennsylvania to my mom, I had an earful. You know about how shameful it is,、um, how much of a taboo it was, and how she thought that I could convert to be straight. And for a minute, I thought I could. Well, you were young enough. I was seventeen, and I thought I didn't want to disappoint anybody. I I heard all about the stigma and the discrimination associated with being gay and the shame that I would bring to my family. I wanted to convert to be straight to life, woman, and to to make my mom proud. 
But later on, I realized, well, I can't. Right. I was born that way. You know, it was not a deformity. Um, it's just who I am. And right. It's very little part of me. But my mom couldn't accept that. And two months living with her, well, after my visit to California to see my aunt, I flew back to Pennsylvania, and she made it absolutely unbearable to live with her. Every little thing I did was a disgrace. You know, everything I touched, she doesn't like, she didn't like. Everything I said, she found it discordant, you know, mm -hmm. and... So what would she say, or what would she do? Well, she, you know, um, we were... Well, here, I don't care, but in Pennsylvania, my mom said absolutely no cooking in the house whatsoever, even eggs. You have to go out to the garage where there are little stalls that you can cook because she doesn't want the house to smell. And um, I, I forgot sometimes, so I cook in the house. And my stepfather went home and yelled at me for cooking in the house. I didn't think it was a big deal. but Did them, they cook in the house? They cook in the house. They just didn't let me cook in the house. Did Were you cooking something different? Just green beans. You know, I just <laughs> sauteed some green beans. They probably ate green beans, too. Yeah, and they, they was angry with me. Um, and then my mom accused me of being sexually inappropriate to my uncle, which was interesting because, well, honestly, I didn't know the guy. I never lived with him my entire life. So when I first saw him, yeah, I thought he was attractive. Mm -hmm. But not in a sexual way, just in a way that you would admire your sister for being pretty. Right, a handsome man. Yeah, a handsome man. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, I want to be handsome like that when yeah. I get older. But um, so I hung out with my uncle that day and his little daughter. Mm -hmm. um, and I went home and at night I was about to go to sleep and I was in my bed with my, with my blanket tightly tucked in. Uh, it's cold in Pennsylvania in <laughs> yes, the winter. Yes, it is. So my mom came home, sat on my bed, and said, wake up, I need to talk to you. And I was asking my mom, what's up? You know, not what's up, but, you know, in Vietnam, like, hi, in mom, like, what's going on? Mm -hmm. um, and my mom told me, asked me, did you touch your uncle's private part or try to? And I was shocked. Oh. I was amazed at what I was hearing you know, I asked her again just to clarify, what did you mean by that? And she said it again. Did you try to touch your uncle? I was in tears at that point. And I pick up, she gave me a little flip phone at mm -hmm. that point. It was nothing compared to my friends. Not that I'm a spoiled brat, but my phone was really old. Just to demonstrate how my mom treated me compared to her later, her son. Um, but I pick up my phone and I call my uncle and said, what did you tell my mom? We hung out today. Nothing happened. You know, like we just talk and, you know, did things around the house. And my uncle said, I did not say anything. And I gave it to my mom like, where did you hear this? This is an insult to me, you know, and I, I knew you didn't. I knew that you didn't like me being gay, but that's that's insult. That's an insult. And it's absolutely you know, Wrong. intolerable, you know. And my mom said, well, I heard it from this person at the shop. And I confronted her and said, so you didn't hear it from my uncle. You heard it from someone some, who heard from someone else. And then you came home and accused me. Um, and at that moment, I realized I could not live with this woman. Right. And she didn't want to live with you. I don't, I didn't, I don't think she did. I don't think she wants to. I mean not wanted, wants to at this point. Um, so I called my aunt. I was in tears and I said, my mom accused me of being sexually inappropriate to my uncle. And she asked me, were you? And I basically screamed at her like, are you freaking serious right now? <laughs> I'm sure you did not swear at her. Yeah, but I, I used the freaking word in Vietnamese, of course, because I, I was upset. You yeah. know? My mother, who was absent 17 years of my life, came back, reunited with me, brought me to the United States, and now two months li with living with her, she accused me of something I didn't do. And not 
she didn't accuse me of stealing money. That I can handle. She accused me of being sexually inappropriate to someone who I respect. Right, right. And I think respect. It was unbelievable. Yeah, respect plays a lot, a huge role in everyone's life, but in the Vietnamese culture, culture even absolutely. more. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You you're not supposed to disrespect your adults. So you came out to California. I did. And I called my aunt and I said, "I can't do this. I can't do this anymore." And my aunt was like, "Well, you want to come live with me?" And I said, "Yes." And you know, she talked to my mom. My mom, of course, gladly hand me off over, mm -hmm. because as my sponsor, my mom was obligated to take care of me. You know, so she could not just kick me out of the house. Mm -hmm. um, but now that someone was willing to, to take you to take me, she just hand me off. Here you go, and. So I flew across the country from the East Coast to the West Coast, you know, and um, from Pennsylvania to California, and I've been here ever since. I first came to Orange County with my aunt to live with my aunt there, but she has two little girls, and I could not walk around my boxer, which was a deal breaker for me. <laughs> <laughs> you like to be comfortable in yes. Southern California. It was warmer. Yeah, and she was strict. She has a lot of rules, and I was still a closet case at that point, so I didn't feel comfortable being so constricted and watching my every move around her because somehow I feel like she would confirm that I was gay. Well, you were a 17-year-old. You were a teenager. Right, so I moved from Orange County to Sacramento, California, to South Sac, to be exact. You, oh, was it oh, South Sac? At Rancho. At you Rancho. Were in, uh, yeah. We could not have been at Cordova High School if right. you were in South Sac. So I moved to Rancho Cordova, and that's how I met you. Right. Yeah. What did you think about school here compared to Vietnam? It was so different. I mean, in Vietnam, you go to school from 8 to 5, mm -hmm. just regular school day, and you eat lunch there, and you sleep, take a nap there. And then at 5, you go home, you have one hour break, and you go to tutor from 7 to 9, which is not mandatory, but is implied. Because if you don't go to tutor, you will fall behind compared right. to all your classmates because everybody go to tutor. Um, and you have to pay for tutor, cash. That's how the student, uh, how the teachers make money. Did you have a tutor? I did. Well, it's not a private tutor. You go... Oh. It's like supplemental class. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So you go to class with the same instructor in the morning, and then 7 o'clock you see him again at night at his house where he set up very, um, how do you say it? It's just temporary table and chair where mm -hmm. students sit and basically teach again, but this time more in depth uh -huh. so that students can follow. Because the, during the school school t school day, you could not learn anything because it was so fast. And, uh, you know, like I said, the tutoring is implied. It's not mandatory, but you have to. It's the necessity if you want to compete with your classmate. And every single student was so competitive. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That's know, different here. That's different here. And in, in Vietnam, in order to get to college, you have to take... Um, a test. You don't just apply. Right. And you, I think I guess you guys take that here. Uh, mm -hmm. It's SAT. Mm -hmm. The SAT um, and the ACT. Yeah, but it's not as competitive as in Vietnam. In Vietnam, a thousand high school students would apply to go to college. About 20 get in. Wow. Yeah, and Very it's not... Very restrictive. And it's not even prestigious college. Mm -hmm. It's just a ordinary, mundane college. Yeah. And you twin, only 20 students get in. How was the language for you in the beginning? It was tough. But as you can see, I talk a lot. So well, you had helps. you had some English before you came, but it was taught with, by someone who had an Ameri uh, a Vietnamese accent, I'm sure. It was terrible. Her pronunciation was just off the chart. <laughs> right. <laughs> Nothing. But you could read a little bit of English. I could read a little bit. And I yeah. could say very um, ordinary sentences like, uh -huh. how are you? Uh -huh. or, My name is such and such. Um, yeah. When I know that you started working right away. Well, I didn't. It uh, wasn't right away. No. Uh, so my aunt who here, mm -hmm. um, she, we In were at Rancho at that point. She sponsored me for about a year. Mm -hmm. um, 
I was 17. I went to high school with you for mm-hmm. about a year. Yeah. I hit 18 and I want to get a job because, you know, even though she was generous in terms of food and clothes, you and didn't. I had I had I had enough, but it wasn't something that, you know, extravagant. And you know, as a teenager, you want more. You want what your friends have. Yeah, you wanted some spending money. Right, and I didn't have any. So I got a job at McDonald's Mm -hmm. through the help of a friend. You remember that Russian girl? Right, right, who worked there and said, oh, you could work here. You're a good worker. (laughs) Yeah, and, you know, her her sister was actually the manager. Uh Uh-huh. So she was so nice, and she said, oh, I'll get you in. You know, my English was still limited at that point, but... It got better. It you had got to better. speak a lot of, and then you became manager or something. Nightmare. I remember that you got a promotion at McDonald's. Uh, I I become a, a a a crew trainer. Oh, okay. So you get like twenty five extra per hour that you work. Uh huh. And twenty five cents. Twenty five cents. <laughs> yeah. So it was eight dollars at first, a base pay, and then eight twenty five. I declined that offer actually. How many? Um, Hours a week did you work while you were going to high school? 25. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh And it it was rough because I worked 25 hours a week. I go to school, maintain a 4.0, of course. Of course. We wouldn't have it any other way. Even in regular, not ESL classes. Yeah, I move fast. But it was rough because my aunt had all these expectations for me. What chores do I have to do? I mean... And yes. tutor her son. Tutor her son and mm-hmm. run errands for her, which I don't have time because I'm going to school full-time and work almost full-time. Was it the second year with her that she kind of wanted you out too because she of threatened. your... She threatened. Um, I didn't get along with her husband because just like my stepdad, um, that was her hu- second husband. Oh. So... They had. She had a son with the previous husband, who was, I think, he's three years older than me. So he was twenty-one at that point. Uh huh. And they didn't get along. And then she gave birth to another son with her second husband. With her second, with mm-hmm. her current husband, and the con- the duo fight quite a bit. They fought quite did, a bit. Did you share? A bedroom with him? I did. You did. I remember. You didn't a, even have your own room. He wasn't very clean. I love him, but he wasn't very clean. <laughs> well, I remember at one point you thought you were going to be tossed out of that house, too. Well, I had conflict with her husband, and, you know, it's just to a point where I'm, I could not handle her expectation because I mm-hmm. had all these responsibility as at 18 years old, and I tried to keep up with my schoolwork. Right. Um, and we fought, and she said, well, if you don't want to do what I, I, I need you to do, then you need to get out. Mm-hmm. And all my life, the feeling of uncertainty has always been in the back of my mind. And every time I encounter a, an uncertainty, it stresses me out. You freak it stresses out. me out. It yeah. freaks me out. Yeah. And my solution has always been I will remove myself from the situation rather than waiting for someone to kick you out the eviction to happen yeah you know so i was scrambled to get money find a well, place and, and we were trying to help you find a place you, you know like live with d or live here yeah. or, and there were other you had you had a wonderful counselor yes and you had other teachers you even though we're on a first name basis with the principal yeah so yeah. I think you had a good support system. Yeah. I mean I wanted to take you home. I know. But you I did. told you yeah. that we uh, wouldn't like each other if we live with each other. So Well, it wasn't that. It was that my husband is such a private person. He was and an introvert. He is still. And um anyway, it how did, I Paul, how did you know that something um wasn't Hip shared with me. Home. I mean the first year Um, I found out his story about his life in Vietnam, not everything. And by by just watching your behavior, I figured you were gay. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. we really hadn't talked about that. But everyone at Cordova, I mean, the adults that you were in contact with knew. Mm -hmm. And so we were all watching out for you and um, being accepting. I think that 
I mean, what was your first impression of me? I remember oh, you told me <laughs> your first impression of we, me. We keep coming back to this, but I remember um, when I first saw you. Well, I mean, your face was kind of grim because you were in a classroom, so you're in a different mode, and you're very kind and nice. But I thought you were so pretentious. <laughs> I thought you were so pretentious because I have. I mean, in Pennsylvania, there was some really nice teacher. Mm -hmm. But when I met you, um, and then saw how you handle all the Russian boys in the class, they was troublemaker. <laughs> and man, they was just fighting left and right and right. curse at you in Russian, which you didn't understand. I don't well, think. yeah, I just ignored it. Right. They weren't disrespectful. I think that's what you found the worst. Right. And you were still so nice to them. And I thought to myself... This lady is so fake and pretentious. Nobody could be this nice. <laughs> I would flip already and probably like smack someone in the head. <laughs> well, you know, again, in, in Vietnam, it's very different. You know, yeah, the dis disrespect. You do not talk back to your teacher because they will hit you and they are loud. Well, once you started sharing things with me, you found out I really was that nice. Yeah, yeah. It, which was refreshing, and you, you, you were that. Um, breath of fresh air that I needed, you know, someone that I can genuinely confine in. Well, and because I've suffered from depression, mm -hmm. and you, sh you know, you were telling me how you were feeling, I knew you were depressed, so right. we could talk about it. Right. And um, it was a safe haven. Right, it was. And you were asking me how, how the senior year was tough, and, and all the story that I, I told you lead up to that year where my aunt was pressuring me to do things. I was going to school 30 hours. I mean, going to school full time, working 25, 30 hours a week, mm -hmm. try to keep up. Um, I went to a depression period. Yes, you did. And, you know, I didn't have the language for it because in Vietnam we, we had the term for it, but nobody talked about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just freaking out because I didn't want to be homeless. Yeah. Which I was for six weeks, mm -hmm. you know, couch surfing from these places to one place right, to right. other friends. Well, place. and if you hadn't had a place, you would have come home with me. Right. I mean, but I always, I always asked you every day, right. do you have a place to stay? Right. And it was, it was a dark time, you know. But it didn't. You got sick too. I got sick. I had appendicitis. I remember. I wasn't the appendicitis. It was the f the infection. Was it an infection? Yeah. It was an infection, and you had a high fever. You mm -hmm. called me. It was a weekend. You hadn't been eating. Yeah, I, I forget what you said your fever was, 101, 102, and I said, isn't your aunt going to help you? And you said no, and I came and got you. Yeah. Oh, I remember. what That was uh, appendicitis, but what happened was I had stomach pain for days, uh, like two days straight, and uh -huh. my aunt thought it would just a flu or a stomach bug or, you know, stomach uh -huh. ache. And she just brushed it off. I'm like, you're fine. You know, just lay well, down. Well, I just, I mean, my, your dad, John, is a doctor. And, you know, he said, he well, he needs to be seen. And mm -hmm. so I thought, well, I'd take you to a doc in the box, just a mm -hmm. clinic. Mm -hmm. But you had just gotten your Medicare or yeah. your Medic, what was it you Medi got when you were 18? Medi-Cal. Medi and they would not touch you even yeah. if i paid them cash right. so we ended up going all the way out to the um the emergency R. room yeah. in roseville yeah and they admitted you immediately yeah <laughs> they knew it was up inside us and well and then your your family stepped up a little bit your cousin mm. came to see you mm. and you know i told everybody back at school you were okay yeah. and but i couldn't believe that such a wonderful young man could just be left to die. I mean, you know, to be well, so. I, didn't know. You probably wouldn't have died. Yeah. But it just, you know, when it some, would have burst. The appendix yeah. would have burst. And because my aunt didn't know. She didn't have any medical background. Right. She probably didn't even know what appendicitis was, yeah. you know. So, but my family did step up and they did come to visit. Yes. And, and they p took you back right. to their house. But I think that the moment where. I re I truly feel connected with you, because if you remember, we were we were close and mm -hmm. I share thing, but I always saw you as my teacher. Mm -hmm. But that 
night when I was in the ER laying on the ER bed for the first time. Well, not the first time. Well, in the U.S. for the first time. And you were there standing right there and I was crying because I was scared. Mm -hmm. And you held my hand. Mm -hmm. And I remember that's when I truly feel connected to you. And mm -hmm. I think that was the first time that I saw you as a mother mm -hmm. instead of a teacher. Right. Um, and I think it, it led to many, many more years of our friendship or mother and son relationship. Yeah. A fa it's, it's a family relationship. I mean, mm. now you've gone on to know my husband well and uh, your daughter and your well son. and you'd met matt because he uh substit uh he did that six month art teaching at cordova and you had him as an art teacher your son yeah yeah and your and daughter then, yeah ellie came back to sacramento and yeah. so we have blunt brunch together and you get invited to all the parties and i know christmas I, thanksgiving i forget which ones Christmas, Thanksgiving, you invite me to almost every holiday that yeah. you have to get together. I truly feel belong at your at you your, do belong. In your family. Um, was, but there it, a, was there a turning point for you? Um, when you feel like I was your son and no longer your You know, student. it was funny because he always called me Ms. Mare. And then he started calling me Mommy. Hip, you called me Mommy. And it was like... I wasn't comfortable with that. I just didn't feel like mommy, because mm -hmm. to me, mommy is like a little kid, and you were you were a young man, mm -hmm. and um, and I thought, well, he you I said you could call me Chris, and he said no. Mm. You said no. I, I call you. I, I I'm gonna call you mommy, mm. and it was then that I thought, well, okay, you're mm -hmm. my son, mm -hmm. and I introduce you as my son mm -hmm. or former student. I mean, I have to clarify it because definitely you're Asian and I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, people oh. get confused. Yeah, <laughs> I know people do get confused yeah. because I'll say my son, you know, and I I'll say hip. I won't say Patrick most of the time. Right. I, I keep forgetting. Batten. Ellie and Ari are good about using Patrick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm just, you know, it's my age, I guess. Mm -hmm. Or that's your boy name. That's you, your son name you to me. Knew, you knew me as long as you know me as have, I have always been hip to you. Yeah. And I, I yeah. introduced myself to Patrick to them. Right. So that's why they remember right. me as Patrick. Yeah. And I'm just, I don't think in high school you really came out. I didn't. You didn't come out to me. I mean, I knew. Mm -hmm. And how did that transition take place? I never really talked to you about when I, I knew that you were dating. Mm -hmm. Had you moved out by then? In high school or community uh, college? After high school. In after high school. Yeah, I moved out at that point, and I was couch surfing for six weeks, and I met this guy, and we just kind of hang out. And um, he happened to have a room for rent, uh -huh. So I rented a room from him. Okay. And then, like a couple months in, we become boyfriends. Okay. So that was the that was your first relationship. Things. Yeah, and I, you know, I think at that point I told you about him. And, yes, you did. And then, and then you, you didn't even blink. You just like, oh, okay, that's wonderful. Yeah. So a lot of people would be stunned for a minute. Oh, like, oh, are you gay? <laughs> but I think you knew all along. So you're yeah. like, okay, that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, well, and. I know that you haven't formally come out to anyone in your family. I think your aunts. Actually, um, the only people in my family who still in denial is my mother. Okay. Like, um, so I came out to both of my aunt at the age of twenty-one. All right. So as soon as I turned twenty-one and could drink. Not that I drink that much. <laughs> no. We enjoy the occasional Bloody Mary at that's brunch. That's right. That's right. But um, as soon as I turned 21, it was my goal to came out to my family. And we, we went to Vegas, actually. The mm -hmm. whole family went to Vegas. And it was not fun because <laughs> all the little kids running around screaming, it just... You me, wanted an adult experience. They gave me headache. <laughs> and they were so annoying, especially the two little girls. I love them now, but... As a little girl, it was annoying. There was, I think there was two or three, and you know, the temper tantrum of two years old are horrendous. You um, didn't really hang out with kids. Oh, God, no. Um, but, you know, I, on the way back from, from Vegas, my aunt, the one from Orange County, she drove the car. 
and I was in the passenger seat directly from her mm-hmm. because we were the two adults in, in that van. <laughs> she has a minivan. She has like a Sienna, I think. She like, filled it up with kids. Yes, and there was two ki- three kids in the back and me and her in the front seat. And, you know, we were just driving and have a conversation. And I just told her, well, you know what, Auntie, I'm gay. And she said, I know. Well, she was the one. So when when my mother first found out about my sexuality, my aunt from Orange County was devastated. She loved me. She loves me as her own son. Mm-hmm. She raised me from zero to five. She was very important. She was in Vietnam. Still. She was in Vietnam at that point. She raised me alongside with her sister, my other aunt and in Orange County. Why your dad wasn't able to kill you? I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, so my both of my aunts and my grandma took part in raising me um, in Vietnam, and she loves me as her own son. She named her first daughter after me. Oh. So, but she double it. Um, so my name was B O. So it just I didn't know I don't know what it means in Vietnam. It's like a, an endearing name. Bo. And she she double that, so it's Bobo, and that's her first daughter name because she missed me so much. Uh huh. Um, but she said. After the incident of your mom accusing you of being gay and everybody knew you were gay, I start researching online what does it mean to be gay? What is homosexuality? Mm-hmm. You know, and what, what does it do to you? How does it affect you? She did all the research. Uh-huh. Um, out of my two aunts here in, in California, she's the one with more knowledge because she came here earlier. Mm-hmm. She learned English. She went to school and she learned English. Mm-hmm. Her English is not perfect, but, but she can communicate. Yeah. The one in South Sac cannot speak English at all. I she's, met her. Yeah, she's a nail when technician. When you were sick. Yeah, and she, cannot, she can say hi and how are you and all that stuff, but she cannot have a meaningful conversation. Mm-hmm. So... Of course, she doesn't do the research. Yeah. And she, they both was upset with me about the fact that I'm gay. But the one in Orange County being a mom to me. And, and her, wanting to be educated. Yes. And she has her mother instinct. She went online. She did all the research. She found out. And she realized that being gay is just a part of me. Mm-hmm. Just like the fact that I like to sing or... Right. I usually take 10 minutes shower. Or you shower. get straight A's all the time, 4.0. We're in a drought, so I don't take 10 minutes shower anymore. No. But, um, you know, she, she realized that it's a part of me, and it's a small part of me. And she realized that if she wants to love me, she has to love all of me. Yeah. And she's the one, she was the one to educate my other aunt, who lives in the South Sac, about homosexuality and what does it mean, and convince her that... If you want Patrick to be a part of your life, you got to love him the way he is. He would not change. He was born that way. Yeah. And I was shocked to hear all of that <laughs> in the van Yeah. driving home from Vegas because we, we drove to Vegas and drove back. Yeah. And I, when I told her, she, she told me, I knew, honey. I, I knew. And I, I and bet I, it made you so happy. Yeah. And she told me, it doesn't make me happy, but I love you anyway. Yeah. And I think that was... Meant a lot. That meant so much. It was exhilarating. Well, she had to step out of her culture. Yes. She had to change. Right. And she's not technically traditional. No. But, but she, she was raised. She, she, she knew enough that she... And she loves me enough yeah. that she will, she was willing to... And she is willing to accept me for who I am. Well, through all this change in your life and you know when you went to American River you got another mom you found another kind woman who helped you with classes and programs Mm -hmm. and what was the great program you got in there at American River College so I um that helped at risk students or yeah um so I I I always joke with you I'm not one mom kind of guy, you know, <laughs> so don't get jealous. Cause and any, I didn't. Yes, and anywhere I go, there will be women who 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 are sympathetic uh-huh. and who want to take me on, you know, just like a little puppy and you just want to <laughs> love me and care for me. Pet your wonderful hair. Yeah. Um, so when I was at community college, we got into 
I got into EOPNS, That's which it. is Extended Opportunity Program and Services. Right. It was, um, I don't know how they got funded, but I know it through American River College, mm -hmm. and that program was wonderful. Yeah, it was for all those p kids I met at the end with, at that award right. ceremony. They all had wonderful stories. Story. But it's no longer, you know, the... The, the, the summer I got in was one of the very last. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. I mean, they still have the program. Oh. But the, the particular condition, terms and condition that I was accepted uh -huh. for under was very special. Uh -huh. So it's called Summer Bridge. Um, so Summer Bridge, the idea was to help you transition from high school to a college. Because mm -hmm. when I got out of high school... I didn't tell you, but I got accepted to UC Davis and Berkeley at the same time. Mm. But I didn't know about financial aid. Mm. I didn't know how to apply for scholarship. Your English was... My English was not the way that I want to be, mm -hmm. wanted to be. So I wasn't confident to apply. I mean, confident to accept the offer, mm -hmm. even though I got accepted to both. Um, I decided that community college was the route for me so mm -hmm. that I can be more confident, more comfortable... So Summer Bridge helped me transition from high school to a community college, you know, and I took a um, success, uh, a college success um, class in that, you know, um, it will help me get into the groove. And that's where I met Linda mm -hmm. Anega. That's her last name, Well, Anega. it helped you a lot. Yeah. I mean, I remember you saying it helped you with English and studying and, and finding out about scholarships. Right, and, right. And, and that's, where, that's where I met Linda, which is your the other mom, mom yeah. second mom, where you close I'm to. I'm first mom. Yeah. <laughs> there, I think there's like five or six, but I only close to the two of you the most. Yeah. There's other one that I, I, I talk to. But I, you know, they don't, they don't keep up. Um, we don't keep the relationship as close as we do. Uh -huh. So Linda was the counselor in the EOPNS program. Mm -hmm. And what's special about that program was that at community college level or even in a university, when you have a counselor, you see a different counselor almost every single time. Right. Um, and so they knew... They knew who you. They they knew like your name and they knew what classes are you taking, but they had no idea who you are. Right. And they had no idea what are you, what is your path, what is your aspirations, well, and what are your dreams. Speaking of your path and your dream, mm -hmm. I'd like the path that you're on. Mm -hmm. Where is it leading right now? Mm. So, after community college. We decided that um, you and me. You needed to be an Aggie. Yeah, we 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 decided. Well, actually, no. I, so when I met Linda, she was my counselor and she was consistent, right? She, mm -hmm. I only saw her because that what's it make the EOP it was like a program special counselor. Counselor, I only saw her and she knew exactly what class I'm taking, exactly what path I'm going to. Mm -hmm. So. Linda and I was planning to apply to Sac State. I wanted to be an RN. I wanted right, to be a registered a nurse. nurse. And I, I always have a fascination for medical field. And I want to practice medicine. And I want to be able to help others because that's mm -hmm. my passion. Mm -hmm. um, but I think fate has a twisted way of making things work. <laughs> so we spent three years and a half. Planning to apply to Sac State because you have to take all the general ed courses um, and get ready to transfer. You have right, to take all, all the requirements. Credit, yeah. um, and I was up, about to apply to Sac State. All that time planning, all the classes taking, and God forbid, I call you every quarter, I mean, every semester, I'm like, Mommy, I can't do this anymore. Yes, you can. And I also call Linda, you know, and I'm like, yeah. Oh my God, but what did I get to be? She didn't correct your papers. She did not. I did. Right. <laughs> Take credit, Mommy. Take credit. I will. I will. But um, all the time planning, all the classes I'm taking, I got all A's on every single class that I have ever taken right. here in the United States. And that quarter, when we were just about to transfer, they told me when I did a transfer agreement, too, mm -hmm. in which they have to accept me if I maintain my grade. Right. Sex, they basically just dumped me. Yeah. 
because it was I mean, it wasn't their fault. Budget cuts were bad at that time, and they I had、remember. a strike. Yeah, all the professor went on strike, and nobody was offering. No, they they did not take any transfer or freshman period. That, right, that semester. Right, I remember. I was. Devastated, because <laughs> I plan all this, and you know me, I'm a planner. I, it, things go out of of whack,、uh, out of the 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 routine that we plan, the the route that we plan. I just get anxious. But you got a better idea. I did. Well, you know, like my all my whole life, it has been chaotic. So I like to control aspect of my life as much as possible, so I don't feel anxious. And I told Linda, like, oh my God, what do we do now? You know, like I plan all this and all this time and effort invested into this route, and it didn't work out. And it was not because I had bad grade. No,、they、it had nothing、anybody. to do with you. Yeah. So after talking and fussing over things. Well, and you had a couple of hospital stays, and you talked to the yeah the RNs, and、yeah. you talked to the PAs.、Yeah. I mean, yeah, and. You, After all that planning and fussing over it, we decide. I mean, Linda and I decided, screw sex day. And I mean, with all due respect, but you didn't take me. So, <laughs> I truly believe everything happened for a reason. So we switched gear and decided to apply to Davis instead.、Mm -hmm. It was not easy because they have a completely separate set of requirements. Yeah. Which means I have to spend another year and three, a half. Yeah, three another year and a half to、yeah. transfer to Davis. It was. Man, I was so discouraging.、Yeah. I was so discouraged because I have to do it all over again. But when we applied to Davis, yeah, wonderful things start to happen. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I got accepted, and、um, I was a region scholar. So what that means is that, along with finance, combined with financial aid. They cover everything: tuitions,、yeah. um, rent. You, you deserved it. Yeah, even transportation fees. Yeah. They they gave they gave me very very good package and a full ride.、Yeah. What it is, what it was, and. Well, you gave back, and you've always had. After McDonald's, all your jobs were helping other people, at-risk youth, and、right. counseling,、right. and sharing your story, and.、Right. And you've gotten chosen to be in some great programs, and、yeah. you've met some great people. So after McDonald's, it was two thousand nine. I started a community college, American River College, and I met this lady. We were in chemistry class together. Her name was Raina,、um, and she was having a tough time in the class because、um, you know chemistry is not for everybody.、No. Um, I got an A, of course,、um, and you know she was struggling, and my teachers was trying to help everybody, but she's only one person, <laughs> so you know I felt bad for the girl because she's next to me, and I offered to help, you know I tutor her for free, and、um, just like study together, and I'll help you out. She's really appreciated,、mm -hmm. you know, and she was working at this nonprofit organization. It's called Mental Health America of Northern California. That's it. And she told me, "Why don't you apply?" Yeah. And、um, after I told her about my story, she talked to her boss, and her boss talked to the executive director. They didn't even hire. They didn't even、um, interview. interview other candidates.、Yeah. The only person they interview was me. Yeah. And I came in basically like an informal interview. And I got the job on the spot. Well, and it was nice because it was flex hours a little bit. Oh, absolutely! Bit,、yeah. And was I was at American River College of taking minimum of twelve unit. Yeah, oh, per, oh full per, load. Yeah, full load for yeah. every semester and working thirty hours a week at、yeah. Mental Health America. Yeah. Um, I was a case manager or youth advocate, they may say. I um help at risk youth. Everybody walk to the door. Has to have、um, some sort of a um, um, mental illness diagnosis,、mm -hmm. bipolar, schizophrenia, depression, you name it, or ADHD. A lot of them have ADHD and ADD.、Mm -hmm. um, but I was the resource、um, guy, you know, a resource center for them. You know, if they come in or assess their case and see what kind of resources they need.、Um, And then refer them out to the community. Also, you know, someone that they can talk to 
the you know the confidant. You've helped lots of people. I helped uh, lots of kids, and I ran um, anger management class. I got certified, and I, I taught anger management class for four years mm-hmm. every Wednesday night at the courthouse on Power Inn. And then I have teen co-ed group where I, it's a safe way for the kids to come in and talk about do the issue. Do you ever sleep? I know, right? <laughs> you do. And um, we also do like community service where I take the kids out to the community to senior center, uh-huh. to the river to pick up trash. And that's part of that community service. Right. You know, and I help them get those hours in and. I got well, paid and now it. I know you're waiting to hear from UC Davis again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you're supposed to hear in November. I hope I get in. I can't so, imagine you won't. And you're going to be in their PA program, right? I hope so. And how many years is that? Three years, three years. And so, then you're going to take care of me? Yeah, well, <laughs> you have Daddy and Ellie, and yes, they're both I in do. medical field. So. Oh, okay, okay. Well, Daddy, well, John... Your husband is a pediatrician, yeah, um, and Ellie is a um, occupational therapist. Right. So, so we keep it either we're teachers or we're in the medical profession. Yeah, so you, you fit right in. Because you are a teacher, and Matt is an art teacher, and Ari is a teacher. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, his so. wife. Yeah. But well, we have a good family. We do. And we added Casey, your friend. Mm-hmm. Well, my boyfriend. Your boyfriend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We've been together almost a year and a half. He's a sweetheart. He is, and he's he work um, for um, the state. Yeah, he work for the yeah. state, and he work in the healthcare field yeah. as well. So he understand. Well, I'm sure glad we got to know each other. I'm glad too. It's been a long journey. It yeah. has. Yeah. It has. Yeah. And, you know, along along our journey, I have turned from someone who was shy, talking about my experience, mm-hmm. to become a motivational speaker. Yeah. You know, I am I'm actually a motivational speaker now with the Stop Stigma Sacramento Speaker Bureau. And um, we go to colleges, community service, um, places, um, high school, middle school, and share my experience. I had depressions, and a lot of people think of mental illness when they look at homeless people on the street mm-hmm. and think of violence. The fact is that people with mental illness actually more likely to be victim of violence than right. the perpetrator. Right. You know, and um, when I share my story as a motivational speaker, I basically try to offer that beacon of hope. I had depressions. Mm -hmm. I attempted suicide. But look at me now. I graduated from UC Davis with a 4.0. And when you have a new problem, you get help. Right. You're not afraid to ask for help. Right. And I share my story so that I can inspire all these kids who are immigrants, who are first generation to go to college, who has all the issues, who are this own LGBTQ kids who think that their future is going nowhere. I'm telling them that if you wanted to go somewhere, it will. Yeah. Because I just graduated from UC Davis and I applied to their physician assistant program, you know, and hopefully we'll get in. We're here from November. But if I could do it, so could anybody else. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know if anybody, (laughs) but definitely you, my my son. Oh, thanks, Mom. Yeah. Well, we've learned to love each other. Well, I just want to tell you that I love you very much. And the the years that we know each other, it, I just can't imagine. I I knew that I probably could do it, but it was so much easier with you by my <laughs> side, you know, and all of your encouragement and your love and make me feel like I had a family before my own family came around mm-hmm. and accept me. You were there. Your family was loving and kind and accepting yeah. And you make me feel we're like... I'm glad to have you in the family. Yeah, you make me feel like I belong, yeah. you know? So. Well, you're always there for me, too. Mm. I try, you know. You you're f- always there. Mm. I yeah. love you, Mommy. I love you, too. <laughs> <laughs>